Well, thank you, Eddie, for your kind introduction. Um, we have a lot of people joining us today, and I'd just like to say welcome to you all. We have uh, people listening at this moment and looking from nine, at least nine different countries. We have them from the USA, Canada, Ivory Coast, Bulgaria, Germany, Nepal, Sweden, India, Kenya. Do you know there's no one from Britain? There may be. Welcome if you're from Britain. So I'd just like to welcome you all, and I know for some of you it's the middle of the night. So please try and keep awake. I'll try and be as interesting as possible. So for you that have managed to get up and it's one or two in the morning, um, I will keep you awake by what I have to say, no doubt. So welcome. And over the next three days, uh, we will be having 10 sessions where we will be looking at the women of the British Pentecostal revival. And as Eddie said, what I'm going to say is based on my book, Searching the Source of the River. The river being the uh, outpouring that we had at the beginning of the last century, the, the, the Pentecostal outbreak, the river of the Spirit of God, searching the source of the river. Now today I am going to start off in this session by giving you all a context for how the women ministered and operated. It's always good to, to look wider and, and see what was going on just a little bit and giving some background and history rather than just launching into the stories. And I'll be doing that in this first session. And then this evening I will be looking at some history. I'll be looking at the women that went before the women of the British Pentecostal revival. Women in the origins of Pentecostalism. Some of the, the overview of what was going on. And then later on this evening, if some of you are still awake, I'll be looking at the, what I've called the first fruits of the year 1907. The first fruits being uh, ladies that before the outbreak of the Holy Spirit in Sunderland in September 1907, paved the way, um, spoke in tongues before anyone else, but I'll talk about that later. And then tomorrow we have four sessions. Um, in the afternoon, we will have two sessions. The first session will be all about a lady who you're going to hear a lot of, and her name is Mary Boddy. And she was the wife of the Reverend Alexander Boddy, who was really at the hub of the Pentecostal revival in England. She's been called the mother of British Pentecostalism. So we're going to have a whole session on her. She deserves a whole session. And then the next uh, session in the afternoon, the next lecture, I called it Catching the Flame. And it's just representative. There are two ladies I'm going to be speaking about who represent so many other ladies that went to Sunderland and caught the flame, took it back to their own towns and cities and began a work there. And then tomorrow evening we'll be looking at two American women of influence, one of whom visited Sunderland, and that was Carrie Judd Montgomery, but the other, who, even though she didn't visit the UK, still had influence upon British Pentecostals. And her name is Mariah Woodworth Etta, who in the States I'm sure you've heard of. And then, to finish tomorrow evening, we're going to look at the life of a lady called Edna Crisp, who was quite uh, well known in early British Pentecostal circles. I won't give the game away by saying any more. But she's another lady that deserves a whole lecture to herself. <clears throat> then Sunday, we have three other lectures, one called To the Ends of the Earth, and we'll be looking at the lives of some missionary ladies who burned their bridges in England and, and risked it all to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then we'll be looking at the life of Polly Wigglesworth. I'm sure many of you have heard of Smith Wigglesworth, well, not many people know that he had a wife called Polly who was his real partner in marriage and in ministry. And for many years, she was the main um, leader in ministry in their mission called the Boland Street Mission. And then, if you're still awake and you're still with me, by, t by Sunday evening, we'll be looking at some of the factors that released women over 100 years ago into their amazing ministry and we'll reflect as well on some of the restrictions. So that gives you an overview of some of the things that we'll be doing over the next three days. Well, it is an honour to present these women to you. 
and at the end of every day there'll be half an hour chat room that you can ask me questions comment I'd love to hear your comments things that have blessed you perhaps you may have some questions and that will be at the end of each day so as I said it's an honor to present these women and to tell their stories and I was thinking, you know, I hope they are all listening and leaning over the grandstands of heaven, nudging each other, saying, hey, they're talking about us down on earth. You can just imagine them, can't you? Elbowing each other. Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear what she's saying about us? So I'm going to launch into the, the first lecture this afternoon, which is not uh, specifically to do with the women, but it is uh, an overview of the British Pentecostal revival, which took place in 1907. Now, <clears throat> in Pentecostal history, those of you that have read your histories, you will have heard of names like Azusa Street. Um, you may have heard stories surrounding the first lady to speak in tongues in America, Agnes Osman. You will have heard of Topeka, Kansas, and Charles Parham's Bible School there, William Seymour, Bonnie Bray Street. You know, these, these are names that, you know, they have legend, they have stories around them. But I wonder, how many of you listening have heard of Fullwell Road? Or Monk Wearmouth? Or All Saints Church? Or even the Reverend Alexandra Alfred Body, Mary Body, Catherine Price? I wonder how many of you have heard of those names because those are names associated with the British Pentecostal revival. The hub of the revival in Britain was a town in the northeast of England called Sunderland. And in England, the power of the Spirit was poured out in Sunderland 15 months after the Azusa Street outpouring. And it became a well where people from Europe, from England, and as far afield as the States and other parts of the world came to drink. Now, Sunderland, as I said, is on the northeast coast of England. It's a centre of heavy industry, or was a centre of heavy industry, iron and steel works, shipbuilding, and it's centred over the Church of All Saints in Sunderland. All Saints was the Church of England church, and it was built over a coal mine. And you can still go there today. Um, back in 2007 was the centennial of the Pentecostal movement in England. And there were celebrations. And I actually was very privileged to be in that church in 1907. And, and speaking at the front about the women of the British Pentecostal revival. And they're very aware of their history. There's a lady vicar there now. And her husband is a vicar in another parish nearby. And they know about the revival. There's pictures of Alexander Alfred Body around the room, around the walls of the, the room in the church. And next to the church uh, was the vicarage. And a lot of the meetings associated with the Pentecostal revival took place in the vicarage. And then just to walk up the road, walk up Fullwell Road, is a parish hall. And that's where some of the more informal meetings took place. And the parish hall today is a church. It's actually an Elim church. And when we had the Pentecostal celebrations uh, commemorating the 100 years anniversary, they had meetings at the parish hall uh, celebrating this. Now, as we will see, Mary Body, the wife of the Reverend Alexander Alfred Body, who you see up here behind me, as a picture of him. Um, as you see, he had an, um, there's Alexandra Body there, and then another photograph of him and his wife Mary, and two of his children, also called Mary and Jane. There was another son called James, but we don't have a photograph of him. So those are some of the main players, the main characters in the Pentecostal revival in Britain. Some of you may have read um, Frank Bartleman's book, Azusa Street, and he said this. Um, he said, this worldwide revival was rocked in the cradle of little whales, brought up in India and became full grown in Los Angeles. No mention of Sunderland. But let me assure you that this worldwide revival 
that was indeed rocked in the cradle of little whales, brought up in India and became full grown in Los Angeles, it had relatives in Britain, very much alive relatives in Britain. So let's just move on and think about how this revival hit the shores of Britain. Now, the Pentecostal revival, um, as it is uh, thought of in Britain, is a story of connections, connections between different parts of Europe and the States, people being in certain places at certain times, uh, setting up a chain of events. Now, <clears throat> Alexander Boddy, who was the minister at All Saints Church, the hub of the revival, and William Seymour, who was the leader of the revival in Azusa Street, they actually never met. Boddy did go to Azusa Street. Um, in fact, he went there in 1912. And when he went there, uh, William Seymour was at, on the East Coast, but he did meet his wife, Jenny Seymour, and they prayed together. So they never met, yet... Obviously, what happened in Azusa, people got to hear of it. They read the Apostolic Faith magazine, and, and there, was, there was connections, even though Body never actually went to Azusa Street. Now, what we're going to look at first is what I've called the Welsh connection. And you will see here a picture of revivalist Evan Roberts, surrounded by some ladies, uh, that he used to travel. They're, they're female revivalists and they would travel with him round Wales. The Welsh Revival began in September 1904 and as I said its leader was this young man called Evan Roberts and for 18 months uh, the revival swept the valleys of Wales and there were 100,000 conversions and in this revival <coughs> women took a very prominent role and as you can see, Evan Roberts um, surrounded himself with these very godly women who were touched by the Spirit of God. There was a group that used to travel with him singing, and they were called the Singing Sisters. And one of these ladies here, her name is Annie Roberts. Um, it's the one with the big hat on the right. And she used to sing in his meetings. Some of you may have heard of the love song of the Welsh revival, mm -hmm. Here is Love Vast as the Ocean, and, and she would hush the audience with her beautiful singing. Of course the press had a field day and tried to pretend that there was something between them, and actually the only dirt that they could dig up um, was that she actually washed Evan Roberts' socks once, which I thought was quite interesting. <laughs> but um, well, the Welsh revival was a connection prior to the British Pentecostal revival. It was also visited by William Smale from Los Angeles in June 1905, who, who went back and started prayer meetings prior to the outpouring in Azusa Street. Now, Body, uh, Alexander Body, I'll sometimes call him Alexander, sometimes Body, so you'll have to know that I'm speaking about the same person. Um, he went to the Welsh Revival. Wherever there was something happening in the world, he wanted to be in on the act. That's the sort of person he was. And um, he went to the Welsh Revival and he said this. He said, the Welsh Revival was a time of conversion and was intended by the Lord as a preparation for the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That was his comment. Um, he met Evan Roberts, um, had meetings with him in Wales, and Roberts prophesied over Alexander Alfred Body. He said, God is going to bless Sunderland. Every barrier is going to be broken down. The Holy Spirit is going to fall on you all. And the power of the Spirit is going to fall over Sunderland. So Roberts saw something in Alf uh, Alexander Body. He saw that this was going to be a place where the Spirit of God was going to fall. And when Body came back from the Welsh Revival, he began prayer meetings in the vicarage in Sunderland. A lot went on in the vicarage, you know, it wasn't in the main meetings, it was in these little side meetings. And Mary Body, his dear wife, was part of that. And they met night after night, praying for revival. And again, he wrote this. He said, there were a people prepared here at Sunderland eager to receive the very fullness of God and longing to honour the Lord Jesus. That was his comment on the prayer meeting that they had. 
few other things about this meeting. He says that in June, three months before the revival, as they were in the vicarage, <clears throat> he said a light filled the room as they were praying. And then the light lingered. They could look out the vicarage and there was the church at the side and the light lingered over the church roof. And in this particular meeting, one man fell to the floor and saw a vision of Jesus. Now, you've got to understand that these were Anglicans. These were not wild people at all. These were sane Church of England Anglicans. So they, they can be wild. But let me just say, English people are not noted for overstatement. So, you know, if they're saying a light filled the room, and if they're saying, I saw a vision of Jesus, we... You know, they're not making it up. That's what I'm trying to say. So another time, Mary, you remember Mary Botty? That's Alexander's wife. Uh, she says a wonderful light fell on her, causing her to laugh as she's never done before. So they were in preparation for what was going to happen in the September. So that's the Welsh connection, giving you some background. Then we have the Keswick connection. Now, you may have heard of the Keswick Conventions. They began in 1875, and you know, they're still going today. They still have Keswick Conventions. And Keswick is in a beautiful part of England called the Lake District. It's in the northwest of England. <clears throat> and in the uh, 1870s and 80s and 90s, it was a centre for holiness teaching. And they would have the key speakers of the day. You know, that's, that's the place. It was the Bible week of the, you know, the day. That's where they went to. It had key speakers there. And it affected, the holiness teaching affected many, many denominations, especially the Church of England. It, you know, it wasn't just nonconformist churches. And women in the Keswick Conventions prayed, played a prominent role. Often they were key speakers there. But unfortunately, the Keswick uh, Convention were to reject the speaking in tongues aspect of Pentecostalism. They would say, yes, we want Pentecost for Britain, but they saw that in the holiness understanding in terms of sanctification without the gift of tongues. So eventually uh, there was a split between what was going on at Keswick and Keswick spirituality and Pentecostal uh, spirituality as in, as in with tongues. Um, I just mention here that one prominent woman in the Keswick uh, circuit was a woman called Jessie Penn Lewis. Some of you may have heard of her. She uh, was involved with the demise, if you like, of the Welsh revival, mm -hmm. and she became very antagonistic towards the Pentecostal revival. She had a negative effect on Evan Roberts after he'd actually had a nervous breakdown and, and influenced him and tried to make him say that the whole of the Welsh revival was a deception and, and too emotional. And she, she really, uh, she used to keep a little black book, actually, and write down everything she didn't like. Uh, so she was quite a negative influence uh, on the Welsh revival. And uh, she was very outspoken when the power of God fell on Sunderland and people began speaking in tongues. She actually wrote to Alexander about his wife, Mary, saying that she was in deception. Mary didn't like that. She wrote sharply back. She was having none of this. So this is just some of the uh, <coughs> connections with Keswick. Now, Mary and Alexander, before they were married separately, they used to visit Keswick. They were very involved and, and they, they took on the whole understanding of holiness teaching. Um, Mary's, Mary had a brother called John Pollock, who was a curate in the Church of England, and um, this is how she met Alexander, actually. Alexander was the vicar of All Saints Church, and he used to hold evangelistic campaigns, and John Pollock was his curate. And so at one campaign, he asked John's sister, who happened to be Mary, to come and sing. So I think more went on in the evangelistic campaigns than just singing, because they did get married several years later. Uh, so there is that Keswick connection. A second, uh, oh no, let me, let me just tell you what um, Alexander said about uh, the Keswick connection and unholiness. He said, we have taught and realized holiness as well as conversion. 
holiness by union with the mighty Saviour in his death and resurrection and glorious ascension. He said, the Lord Jesus was and is the centre of teaching and worship at Sunderland. And this is interesting. This is his comment. He says, surely this has been the secret of blessing. And we think it is the one reason for his willingness to use this place. And as I go on talking about the women and some of the things that were said, you will see that there is a great emphasis on Jesus not on manifestations, not even on the tongues, but on Jesus, which is very interesting. Another connection that we want to look at, I've called that the India connection. Now you might say, what has India got to do with England? But there was a lady uh, called Pandita Ramabai. I have her picture. I'll just pop it there. Pandita Ramabai. She was a uh, she was a converted Brahmin woman who was studying in England uh, at Cheltenham to be a teacher. She visited the Keswick Connection and she went back to India and in 1899 founded a home for widows, young girls who had been widowed. And it was called Mukti, Mukti Mission. Mukti means freedom, liberation or salvation and it was near Pune in northwest India. And she heard of the Welsh revival as well, and she challenged her girls, these young widows, to pray for revival in India. And by June 1905, there were 550 girls meeting twice a day for prayer. And the Holy Spirit was outpoured on these girls, totally separate from anything that had happened in Azusa Street, anything else in the world. It was, it was something which happened just there in India with no real connection. No one had gone to Azusa Street and come to Mukti. It was a sovereign move of God as these 550 widow girls were seeking God and praying. And this uh, connection with India was well known to English Pentecostals. They had uh, letters sent from Mukti and um, later on, uh, an American Southern Baptist missionary called Minnie Abrams, who was working over there in India with Pandita Ramabai, she actually came over to England with Pandita's daughter, and they visited Sunderland. So it's no surprising, it's not surprising that the first women missionaries from England went over to Mukti Mission in uh, northwest India. Um, now, Sunderland, interesting history, Sunderland. The place where the revival started was, a spe was one area of Sunderland called, and I'll say it slowly so you pick up what I'm trying to say here, Monk Weir Mouth. Monk Weir Mouth. Monks at the mouth of the Weir. The Weir is a river that cuts down into the sea at Sunderland. Sunderland. So right the way back, historically, there had been a centre of Christianity in that very place where the revival broke out. There had been monks at the mouth of the Weir. Um, a very famous um, historian, um, churchman, was the Venerable Bede, who in AD 3, 731 uh, wrote the history of the English church and, his peop and its people. He was the most important European scholar of his age. And that was at Monk Weir Mouth, where there were monks at the mouth of the Weir. There's a, a, it's not the purpose in this lecture to give a history of what has happened in Sunderland, but it's, it's, it's as if God prepared the place. You, know? <laughs> you can look back at the, the people that have ministered there um, the Quakers, the Methodists, they all had the most success when they went to Sunderland. And we'll be looking at some of that later. And in fact, um, the Reverend Alexander Alfred Boddy recognised this. And he said, the Lord has had witnesses in Monk Wearmouth throughout the ages. So he actually saw what was going on in Sunderland, in Monk Wearmouth, as you know, he could see the history behind it and said, yes, the Lord has had his people in, you know, throughout the ages, and he saw himself as following on in succession. So, one more link in the chain. 
And I've called this the Norwegian connection. So we've had the India connection, we've had the Welsh connection, and now we have the Nor and the in yes, the India connection, the Norwegian connection, the final link in the chain of the outpouring in Sunderland. Now there was a pastor in what is now Oslo, it was then Christiana, the capital of Norway. His name was Thomas Ball Barrett. And he was the son of an English tin miner and went to Norway as a child. So he spoke English and yet he was Norwegian and had a church there. And he was on a fundraising trip to the United States, in the eastern United States, when he heard about the revival taking place in Azusa Street. And he sought out people who had received the Holy Spirit uh, from the blessing that was poured out in Azusa Street. And he actually got baptised while he was in New York and spoke in tongues. <clears throat> and that was October uh, 1906. And he carried that back home. Many were baptised in his church. They spoke in tongues. They were actual tongues of fire. They were visions of Jesus. And again, Alexander who would travel to where God was moving. I think that was a, a reason God was able to use him as well. He travelled to Christiana because he wanted what he heard that um, Thomas Ball Bar Barrett and his church had received. And he said this, he travelled there in March 1907, and he said this, remember Oslo was Christiana. He said, my four days in Christiana can never be forgotten. I stood with Evan Roberts in Tony Pandy, but have never witnessed such scenes as here in Norway. He says that as he knelt down, surrounded by the Norwegians, a power from on high seemed to thrill through them to me. It's interesting that he says that was his baptism, but he didn't speak in tongues until the 2nd of December. Uh, he saw a distinction. He, his theology was always a little muddled <laughs> but he did see a distinction between that experience that he had in Norway and later when he spoke in tongues. So what Body did was invite Barrett back to Sunderland and he came on the last day of August 1907 and he stayed for six weeks and the fire fell in Sunderland. Now meetings were held in the parish hall not in the main church. And the local paper, which is called the Sunderland Echo, said this about what was going on in the meetings. You can just imagine it, can't you? Do you know they're holding some extraordinary services at Monk Wearmouth? Why, everyone is talking about them. Women throw themselves on the floor and babble in unknown tongues. That was in the local paper. And it became the theme, the one theme of conversation in the neighbourhood. Now, at first, these meetings were small, but on uh, the in the October fourth edition of the Newcastle Daily Chronicle, it said this: Newcastle is a town a few miles away. It says this: the meetings are attracting widespread interest. Two meetings are held each day: one in the afternoon, another at night, and these are crowded. For the most part, the meetings are conducted along the lines of a revival meeting, and the audience break out into spontaneous prayer and hymn singing. The emotional faculties of the worshippers are aroused to a very high pitch by the exhortations of the conductor of the service, and it is, excuse me, it is no uncommon spectacle for one of them to throw themselves on the ground, weeping, while others gabble and utter what appear to be unintelligible sounds. So these were reports in the, the local paper. Having said that, the meetings, if you read the, the accounts written at the time, and you read the accounts of what was going on in Azusa Street, what was happening in Sunderland was far less raw than what was going on in the States. And it's interesting that the, the meetings they had in Sunderland, they were in two sections. The first was a time of prayer and praise with good biblical, solid biblical teaching. Then they used to close the doors and shut 
the doors so that no one could get out and no one could get in. <laughs> um, now they did that because the second part of the service um, was a time when, oh, they wanted people there who were just serious about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you were not serious, they just wanted you out. But they also didn't want curious onlookers coming in, so they'd lock the doors. And the meetings used to go on till really late at night, just like they did at Azusa Street. And by the end of 1907, uh, reports were appearing in the national press saying that more than 20,000 people around the world were filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. But still, the numbers were relatively small in Bodies Parish. There was only 25. But articles were appearing in the national press in England about this, telling of visions of Christ, um, and people singing, they, they said they were singing, in sweet, silvery, unearthly voices. That was in the national press, singing in the spirit, we would call it. And it aroused, the, these um, newspaper reports aroused great curiosity in England, and so they did the work for them. The, the secular press was spreading what was going on and people would come to check it out, as we would say. They wouldn't say that a hundred years ago, but we would say they went to check it out. Uh, so that's something of the background. Um, and the revival continued building. It was building right the way from September 1907 until the First World War. And this is the context for looking at what the, the role of women was in those early days. Let me read you something else that uh, our friend Alexandra Alfred Body said. He said, the Lord has blessed of us the hundreds who from the very beginning up to this present hour, he wrote this in 1912, <clears throat> have been receiving the blessed baptism of the Holy Ghost here in our meetings at Sunderland. The Lord has also been graciously healing the sick all the time. He has never withdrawn his presence or his power. Uh, and to our meetings here come members of almost all Christian bodies in this town and visitors from other places, and they carry the blessing back to their own communities. That gives an overview of what was going on in those years between 1907 and the First World War in 1914. Now, what I want to do is look um, at two important things that happened in Sunderland that helped shape Pentecostal theology. And in these two things I'm going to talk about, women pay, played a, an amazingly crucial part. And the Pentecostal message was disseminated worldwide, firstly through the Sunderland Conventions. And you'll see a picture of some of the Sunderland sisters, the ladies that... Um, were taking part in the, uh, the second, actually, Sunderland Convention in 1909. And then um, I will be speaking about confidence, where uh, a magazine was disseminating the information from Sunderland around the world. Okay. So first of all, confidence. We have here... Um, we have here a page of confidence. This is a magazine. And uh, it was because of this magazine that we know so much about the Pentecostal revival in England. In April 1908, seven months after the revival, the Lord put it in the heart of Alexander Body to edit and publish this magazine. He called it a free Pentecostal paper. And it was the first British paper that told of this outpouring with the sign of tongues. And the importance of this magazine cannot be overestimated. It spread the message that Alexander and his wife Mary wanted to spread around the world. Alexander said, It is meant to be a means of grace and mutual encouragement, encouragement to lonely ones and scattered bands, to those who are attacked by doubt and difficulty, but longing to be loyal to the almighty deliverer. They will find from these columns that they are not alone as regards even human fellowship. But there are many that have perfect confidence, the name, that this work is of God, 
and who will be rejoicing to know that his Pentecostal blessing is spreading all the time. Confidence was named after two scriptures which I will just mention to you. One is 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything uh, according to his will, he hears us. So people were asking for the Holy Spirit and they received it and they had confidence that God would answer them. The second scripture is in uh, Proverbs 3.16. The Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. So there was a pointing to confidence in the faithfulness of God to answer prayer and to keep them. Now, two ladies were involved with this magazine and I'm not going to speak about them too much uh, this these 10 sessions that I'm speaking on but you will find a chapter in my book on these two ladies their names were Margaret Howell and Mabel Scott Margaret and Mabel they were just two ordinary spinsters who felt they were called to go to Sunderland to help put this magazine together now, if they had not been there, faithfully editing, putting this magazine together, sending it out, then we wouldn't know everything that we know about the Pentecostal revival. And I wouldn't be standing here today talking about it. So we owe a lot to these two sisters from Sunderland, Margaret and Mabel, these two spinsters. Um, let me just give you some statistics here and you'll see what I mean. Um, by January 1910, 4,000 were sent out monthly from Sunderland with an average of five readers a copy. Now, if you do your sums there, that's 20,000 readers altogether. It was sent around the world. And Alexander worked out <laughs> that to do this, they had to handle three tons of paper over three years. So he'd done his sums as well. And this... Pentecostal paper, as they called it, uh, travelled to nearly every country in the globe, as Alexander said, where English was understood. Letters would come back, grateful letters, uh, saying how much it had helped them. And he says right at the beginning, he, he puts his foundational theology into this magazine. So right from the beginning, what Alexandra wanted in it was sent out round the world. So he had such a say in, in what early Pentecostals believed. He said that confidence advocates an unlimited salvation for spirit, soul and body, the honouring of the precious blood, identification with Christ in death and resurrection, regeneration, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the soon coming of the Lord in the air and divine health and healing. And it was those subjects that uh, were being taught in confidence. <clears throat> it uh, contained reports of what was going on in Sunderland and the conventions, which I'll be speaking about in a minute. It contained testimonies of people receiving the Spirit. It contained letters. It contained teachings. It had columns called Pentecostal items, which told of what was happening around the country. Um, it had extensive, extensive cover of the missionary endeavour. And from 1909, it acted with, as an authoritative voice of the Pentecostal movement. Now, Mary Body, this is Alexander's wife, was a prolific writer. She was a theologian. And every copy of Confidence, I would say, had some of her teaching. And so what Mary Body began to teach was disseminated through confidence, through the written word, um, and also many other women who ministered in the revival. Now, one of the people who I'll be referring to over this weekend is someone called Donald G. He actually became the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Great Britain and Ireland. And he was an historian as well. And his history of the Pentecostal movement was called Wind and Flame. And you can learn a lot about the early movement through that. 
And he said about confidence, he said God honoured confidence in a special way and was pleased to make it one of his principal channels to bring many in touch with the Pentecostal blessing. He said it was highly treasured by hungry hearts. And he says this, which is interesting, he says there was a rare anointing that rested on those early issues. And in fact, I've actually read every issue. I've sat there and looked at them uh, where they're archived in Mattersea Bible College. And they are very special to read. And of course now you can get them on disc. If anyone wanted to read the whole of the history of confidence, you can actually buy the, the disc with, with all the issues on. Now the second thing I want to talk about, um, <clears throat> we talked about how confidence disseminated the Pentecostal message around the world. The second important thing is the Sunderland Conventions. I showed you the picture we have here of the Sunderland Sisters. Now, these were conventions which Alexander Boddy and his wife Mary began from 1908 onwards to the outbreak of war in 1914. Um, the first one, which happened at Whitsuntide in 1908, which is the end of May, beginning of June, there, uh, uh, it was thought that um, at that time there were 500 people in Britain as who Alexander said were in the experience. And so they thought it would be a really good idea to have these conventions. But you know, you couldn't go unless you had signed a little card to say that you were in full agreement with the teachings that were going on in Sunderland and that you would also accept the ruling of the chairman. So they weren't open to everybody. They didn't want people coming to disrupt. Uh, so you, you had to have a, a signed declaration, an admittance card, before you were allowed there. But these conferences were incredibly effective. People would come from England. They were the flagship of the emerging movement. And they brought unity amongst the, the believers who had been filled with the Holy Spirit. They had speakers from England, uh, speakers from Germany and Holland. And in one early conference, there were 32 people who uh, were, 32 nations rather, that were representing, represented. And like confidence, what was said at the Sunderland Conventions was, was a foundational theology and understanding of the Pentecostal movement in England. And the messages that were spoken, many by women, were reprinted in confidence. Um, much of the teaching at these conventions was by Mary Boddy and many other women whose lives we'll be looking at. And what is interesting, if you read the accounts which, which are in confidence of the early conventions, especially the first Sunderland Convention, what we see is the amazing unity between men and women, between social classes, between denominations. It was like a visual aid as you read um, what confidence has to say about the first Pentecostal uh, Sunderland Convention. It's like a visual aid of Galatians 3.28 where it says, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you keep that, in your mind as you read the account of the first Sunderland Convention, you will see that that's exactly what happened. And it's amazing how you see the women take part. Um, they're, they're speaking, they're in business meetings, they're giving interpretations, they're prophesying, they're speaking in tongues, and they're given an equal platform with the men. So, the beginning of the Pentecostal movement in England. It was a time, you know, in England where women, and in other parts of the world, in the States, and I'm sure in Canada as well, where women were pushing traditional boundaries. We see that clearly in the suffrage movement, you know, but these women um, in the Pentecostal revival, they didn't take their cues from the secular world, but rather from the spirit, the, ho the freedom that the Holy Spirit was giving them. Giving them. And we read and we hear of women who were preachers, teachers, evangelists, pastors, prophets, leaders of prayer groups, women who ran missions, women who planted churches, women who were editors, 
women who were writers, reporters, administrators, women who travelled round Britain carrying the Pentecostal message, women who spoke regularly at conventions all round the country, women who opened their homes as homes of rest, healing homes. Many heard the missionary call and went to the ends of the earth. One historian in England uh, called Desmond Cartwright, he's an Elim historian, he said this. <clears throat> he said, women were an integral part of the narrative and without them we may speculate that the Pentecostal revival may never have taken place. Pentecostalism may glory in the fact it has no founding father, which you may say is debatable. He says, but it did have many nursing mothers who kept it alive in its infant years. Now, this is not immediately obvious when you read the Pentecostal histories. I've mentioned the history Wind and Flame, which was written by Donald G. And he only gives a, f a few fleeting references to these women. And there's another book that he wrote, which has a very interesting title. It's called These Men I Knew. And it actually has the short biographies of 23 men, uh, 23 men and four women, but the title is These Men I Knew, which is interesting. Now, when I was researching this, I had to be a detective. I really did. You had to read between the lines. And the only way that you could find out what was really happening is to go right back to the original documentation, the original letters, the source material that was written at the time. And you found a whole different picture building up. Hence the title of my book, Searching the Source of the River. I did a lot of searching. And as I was searching, um, the Lord led me to some verses which are in the book of Job. And I'm going to read them to you. It's the book of Job, chapter 28, verses 1 to 11. And it says this. <clears throat> there is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth, and copper is smelted from ore. Miners put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for ore in the blackest darkness. Far from human dwellings they cut a shaft. In places untouched by human feet, far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Sapphires come from its rocks, and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows that hidden path. No falcon's eye has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it, and no lion prowls there. The miner's hands assault the flinty rock, and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all the treasures. And here's the bit. They search the sources of the rivers and bring the hidden things to light. And I felt the Lord say to me that there is a, there is a mine, there was a place to dig. And these places that I was going to dig <laughs> and research, they were forgotten places. These women have been forgotten, written out of the history. But work was involved. I had to do my tunnelling through the rock, verse 10. I had to search the farthest recesses. And that's verse 3. Verse 9, I had to assault the flinty rock, lay bare the roots of the mountains. And then it says in verse 6, I believe the Lord said to me that if I did that, sapphires would come from its rocks and its dust would contain nuggets of gold. And then in verse 10, the eyes of the person who tunnels through the rock will see all the treasure. So I've done the digging, and I've seen the sapphires, and I've seen the gold. And so my book, Searching the Source of the River, is uh, stories about the ladies, the sapphires, and the nuggets of gold. So over the next nine sessions, I'll be sharing with you some of those other hidden things that have come to light.